making all things new. New. Have you ever wanted to start over? Have you ever wished the things that you said or the things that you've done or the action could just say, I wish I wouldn't have said that. Wish I wouldn't have done that. Or you could say on the other side of that, my life is wonderful. Sometimes we've done great things. And sometimes we're caught up so much in the past of how great we are or how bad we are. We don't live in the present and God cannot give to us a future. The scripture that uh, Josh just read, the first part of that is talking about uh, Moses leading the Israelites out of captivity across the Red Sea. God delivered them. God did great things for them. He said that I can do whatever I want to do for you. Watch what I did with the most powerful army on the planet at that time. You crossed the Red Sea. Did you kill the army? Did you save yourself? No. I did that for you. When you crossed the Red Sea, the armies were chasing you and the waters collapsed upon them. There was no one still alive that was in the Red Sea. But you Israelites, you already made it across. I saved you. I redeemed you. I took care of you. And then he says this in verse 18 and 19. Do not remember the former things. He said, I've done great things for you, but don't get caught in what I have done in the past. Nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now I shall sh spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and the river in the desert. Sometimes we have to say, God, I need you, and he is going to be beside you. And so often, I want you to get this quote, so often we are so full and so preoccupied of our past, good and bad, that we are not living properly in the present because our guilt or our ego is eating us up and we're living in the past today. And God is saying to us, as he said to the children of Israel, I want to do a new thing within your life. We are so captivated by our past. We are not giving God room to do anything into the future. And if we are not allowing God to do things in the future, we are going to live in misery. Or even in sin, in our ego of being spiritual, how God is doing great things within our life. We have to wake up new every day. I love the song that he just sang, new, a new life. He can do all things new within our life. And we have to wake up with expectant, expectancy that God can do great things within our life. If we do not, if we are living our life preoccupied in our past, we will never deal with tomorrow. Never. You tell me your issue. You tell me what you're going through. You tell me your fears. You tell me your insecurities. You tell me your sin. And I'll tell you that you are captivated by your past. You're captivated to a point that God cannot open the door and do great things for you and through you. But there's a word that we have to understand. We have to understand where we were. And sometimes we even say we have to know what to do. But I believe there's a word that sometimes we always say that guys don't like the word that starts with a C and it's called commitment. Do we want commitment? See, I believe so often that we are so full of knowledge that I can tell you what the Bible says. I can tell you what you need to do. But so often we have to understand it takes commitment to wake up and say, I want a new thing today. I want to do something fresh today. Because if you are like me, it's easy to live in yesterday. 
It's easy to live over what I've always done. It's easy to say, this is what I know. It's hard to say, I need to learn a new thing. I need to do something fresh. I need to do something new. Because it takes commitment. It takes work to start fresh and new. Because I know what I did. I don't know what God is going to do. And sometimes I'm afraid of God because he may ask me to do something that's uncomprehendable to me. So we need to stay committed. Let me give you a quote. I have some quotes I want to give to you with these points that, uh, that I think are good. Stay committed. It says this. Commitment is an act, not a word. Commitment is seen and not heard. When you're committed to something, you don't accept excuses, just results. Commitment. It's not saying, oh, I want to try something. I want God to do something. Commitment is, I am not going to fail. I'm going to wake up tomorrow with the same power that I made that commitment today. So I want to give you five goals, I believe, in our commitments. If we want a new thing, if you want a new life, if you want something fresh, if you're tired of where you are or where you've been, God wants to give you some things. And the first one, commit yourself to forget your, what do you think it is? Failures. We have, to, we have to give God the ability to give us forgiveness. And forgiveness is God forgave you. Do we comprehend that as Christians? When you gave your life to Jesus Christ and you asked God to forgive you of your sins, do you realize your sins are forgiven? And guess what? There's not a comma after that. It's a period. Your sins are forgiven. But the other side of that is there's two aspects to that, the God's forgiveness and your forgiveness. And so often we're living in the past to a point that we do not allow our ability to ourselves to forgive. We thank God for forgiveness, but we can't forgive ourselves and our failures. 2,000 years ago, a great Bible scholar wrote these words. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do, what's he say? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. There's some times that we have to shut the door. To shut the door. Now, I know there's deep pain. And I know there's hurt. And I know that things that have happened to you and things that you have done have captivated and hurt you. And I know that people have hurt you. But if we do not shut the door, we are the ones that are in the pain. And if you want a new fresh life, if you want power in your life, you have to shut the stinking door. I take much comfort in what Paul wrote. Forgetting what lies behind. You see, I cannot think of a goal. And I can't think of my future unless I shut the door to the past. Every mistake we make, every failure, every fail becomes grace in God's hands. And we needed grace. And God is full of grace. Grace is something that's such a wonderful thing. Grace is God's love bestowed upon us. Even in our failure. He loved us. See, I love this quote. You can't do anything more for God to love you anymore. And you can't do anything bad for God to love you any less. God loves you. God has forgiven everything about your life. I, 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 this is church. I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to ask you to do this. Think about your worst sin. Now in church, this is kind of scary, I know. Think about your worst sin. And think about this. God forgave you at your worst. Whatever it is, God forgave you. Now what we have to do is turn it around and say, if God, the creator of the universe, loves me enough 
to forgive me at my worst, I can accept God's forgiveness. And I can look at who I am, not out of my sin-filled eyes, but of God's grace-filled eyes. Because God loves you. We have to love others, and we have to accept that forgiveness. Listen to this quote from John Burroughs. A man can fail many times, but he isn't a failure until he begins to blame somebody else. If we start and keep blaming other people for our sin and for our failures, we have never accepted the forgiveness of God because all we're doing is blaming somebody else. And it's also called, in counseling, self-awareness. It's easy to blame somebody else for your problems. But until we take ownership of mine, I will never be able to be forgiven. And I'll never be able to forgive. We live in an incredible time where weak people and hurting people hurt people. And sometimes when hurting people hurt other people, we get hurt. And the thing that we do when we get hurt is the second point. Ready for this? Commit yourself to give up your grudges. <laughs> give up your grudges? You don't know what they did. You don't know how bad they hurt me. You can't comprehend how bad it felt. I will never forget what they did. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we have to remember that God forgave us at our worst. And hurting and weak people hurt people. And Christians, we're bought by the power and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not our own. And what we have to do is we have to accept what God has given to us and live our life as believers in Jesus Christ. And even though weak people hurt you, do you think Paul was weak? No, no. Paul was a martyr. Paul was one of the greatest powerful men in the word of God. And he forgave. Even though he was beaten. He loved others and wanted to share the good news of Jesus Christ to others. Even though they betrayed him and hurt him. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. When you have a grudge, when you have a hurt, when you have a pain, you have somebody that rubs you the wrong way because of something they have done. Colossians chapter 3, verse three, 13. A complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. At your worst, Christ forgave you. At somebody else's worst, you must forgive them. Even as Christ forgave you, that is what we have to understand. That our feelings are not the beam. It's not the, it's not the standard. Christ's love and forgiveness is the standard. Forgiveness is the act of undying untying yourself from your thoughts and your feelings that bind you in defense of commitment against somebody else. Forgiveness is one of the hardest things that you'll ever do. And it's something that we can talk about. It's something that we can say. But forgiveness is an act. Forgiveness is tough. Because our pains are real. And if we cannot forgive, if we cannot love at our worst... And at somebody else's worst, we are not carrying out what Christ has commanded us to do. Church, we all need forgiveness. Anybody not need forgiveness? Yesterday, did we do something wrong? Did we think something bad? Did we hurt somebody's feelings? Every one of us need forgiveness. But what we must do is offer that forgiveness. Let me give you another quote. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It's a commitment. It is a choice to show mercy. Not to hold an offense up against the offender. Forgiveness is an expression of love. When you say, 
please forgive me. Or when you say, I forgive you. It is an expression of love to yourself and to others. A grudge is simply a manifestation of bitterness. When I grudge, when I have a grudge against somebody, it's just saying, you ready for this? I deserve my pain. And I deserve to not like you because of what you've done to me. And Jesus could have done that exact same thing to you. Do you realize that we put Jesus on that cross? It wasn't the Roman soldiers. And it wasn't Pilate. Because of our sin, Jesus bore that cross to redeem you from your sin. A grudge is saying, I am better than what Jesus did. Because we betrayed him and we sinned. He died. And what we must do is we must say, I forgive you. And not hold the grudge to other people. Forgiveness is probably the biggest barrier of healing in our life. When we can forgive others, God can take care of us. Let me give you another quote. Forgiveness is unlocking the door to set someone free. And realizing you we're the prisoner. You know what that means? When we don't forgive, we are the one that hurts. The person that we need to forgive probably doesn't even realize that you're mad at them. They probably don't even know they did something wrong. And we are caught in that bitterness of unforgiveness and that grudge to a point that I say, I am going to forgive you. And when you unlock that prison door of forgiveness... You know who's set free? You. When you set someone else free of your heart, we are set free in our heart. So forgiveness and grudges. And then commit yourself to restore your relationships. We live in a world filled in broken relationships. Nations against nations. Ethnic groups against ethnic groups. Gangs protect their turf. Husbands and wives divorce one another because of all kinds of problems. Young people are so often violently at each other and have odds against everything that they do. But in our culture today, I believe the biggest war that we have is ethnic groups against ethnic groups. And to be set free and to have a new life, we cannot have a prejudiced bone in our body. What we have to do is God loves everyone. For everybody. And what we have to do is we have to love and forgive and not hold any resentment against any person for any reason. What we have to do is be willing to forgive and change somebody's life. In Romans chapter 12 verse 18 it says, If it possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with some men. It says all men. The ones that I like, no, all men. The ones that don't offend me, no. If it's a, a bi ability within you, depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Let me give you this quote. If we open a quarrel between our past and our present, we shall find that we have lost the future. Let me give that to you again. You can hardly see that up on the screens. If we open a quarrel between our past and present, we shall find that we have lost our future. If I was completely honest with you, do we want to live in the past? Aren't we excited about what God can do for us into the future? And God wants to give it to us a great, a new thing, a new life. But so often we're caught back here that we can never open the door to the future. And then the fourth thing, I believe is something that we need to do is commit yourself to improve your worship. What does that mean? Worship is my expression of gratitude to God. Worship is not what we do up here on Sunday morning for 20 minutes. If that's the only worship that we do, we're not really worshiping. Our lives should be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Our lives should be something that we worship God in. 
What is a life worship? What does it mean to say, I want to live my life worshiping God? An individual that worships God lives his life pleasing unto God, not only at church. It lies in our total life worship. If we don't get our act together before we come to church, we can't expect to worship at church. We can't expect something magical to happen once we're inside the church doors. Worship is an act of saying thank you to God. At church, corporate worship, we can raise our hands and we can dance and we can love and we can worship and we can sing our songs. But it, what it is is it doesn't magically happen when we open the doors. Worship takes place before we come here. And when we come here, we can corporately worship. It's not just when we walk in the doors. There's two things I want to share with you. In Psalms chapter 95, 6, it says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the, our maker. Let us give him the preeminence within our life and our worship. Let us kneel before our Lord. Worship is actively serving and working and ministering. See, sometimes we say, I'm going to the worship service. Anybody ever heard that? Let's have a worship service. But worshiping is not in a service. Worshiping can be in music. It can be in preaching. It can be in reading. It can be in the preaching. But it is also, worship is actively serving and ministering to others. And how do you find that? In Joshua chapter 24 verse 15. Listen, this is the most powerful verse you can have. And if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve whether the gods which are your fathers served when we were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you will dwell. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Service is worship. We will serve the Lord. When we serve the Lord, it comes into an action. And I want to give to you one of those powerful verses of the entire Bible. It's found in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And if we get this verse, it changes everything about us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So I want to give you three words in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. The first one is present. That is a military term that you present yourself to service. You stand up for you stand up in front of your leader, the captain of the guard, or you stand before the president of the United States and you say, I am here to serve this country. What you're doing, you're presenting yourself. And the Bible says we need to present ourselves to God. I am ready. And then he says, present your bodies. Bodies. That means my body, soul, and spirit. Everything about me. I am presenting myself. I am presenting my body. Lord, what do you want me to do? With my hands, with my feet, with my mouth, with my actions. Everything I do represents you. And the third word is sacrifice. And sometimes we think sacrifice is what we give up. But sacrifice in the Bible is not what we give up. It's allowing God to do what he wants to do within my life. I'm not giving, when I got saved... I didn't give up a life. When I got my, my life to Christ, I gained a life. I gained a new future. And that is a sacrifice that he has given to me. A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let me read it to you as the message. I, I preach out of the New King James. I love the New Living Translation. And I love the Message Bible. So let me give you that translation out of the message Bible. It says this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life. Your sleeping, eating, going to work and walking around life. And place it before God as an offering. Everything that you do is a worship. Everything that you do before God is wonderful. One of the a good theologian A.W. Tozer said this. If you do not know the presence of God in your office 
or in your home, then God is not in the church which you attend. I have come to believe that when we are worshiping, if the love of God is in us, the Spirit of God is breathing and praising within us, all the musical instruments in heaven are suddenly playing in full support. It is the experience that our total lives, our entire attitude as persons, must be towards the worship and the service of God. When we can do that, God can do great things with us. Worship is a response of the entire lives that God has given to us. Let me give to you the last, and I think probably the most important part. Commit yourself to grow your ministry. You know we're all ministers, right? I'm not just the only minister at this church. We are all ministers. And Josh, if the youth department is going to grow, it's not going to be you. It's going to be the kids. Rachel, if our children's ministry is going to grow, you may be the leader, but it's not going to grow because of you. It's going to grow because of the kids and the power that God has upon you. Leslie, if the women's ministry is going to grow, it's not going to be you. You can be the leader, but it's going to be every person coming alongside us. And I love this term, own the ministry. Whatever ministry that you're involved in, whatever time that we spend in ministry, we have to own our ministry. If it's in the small groups, grow it. If it's in leadership, if there's a problem, attain it. Go after it. Serve it. Learn from it. And if it needs to be confronted, we need to confront it to grow it. What we do not evaluate will stagnate. And what we have to do is we have to own our ministries. And we are the ministers. I've watched for four weeks not being here. And I've seen in those four weeks, <laughs> I'm going to say this in a funny way, but you don't need me. You don't. You are all ministers. And the church, this church, can and does thrive, not because of me. It thrives and survives because of you. Because you are the church. It is your church. You don't just come to church. We are the church. And if these seats are going to be full... It's not going to be because of me. It's not going to be because of Justin. It's not going to be because of the staff. It's going to be because of you. If people are going to get saved, usually it's not because of me. It's usually because of you. I hang around Christians all the time. I, I work at the church. I don't have, unless they're asking for money. Josh had two guys in one day come in and asking for money. I said, you take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> you're a newbie come on you need to learn how to do that and he comes out he has to take care, take care of that it's kind of fun watching him I don't know what to do I said oh you'll learn everybody's a scam they're asking for money uh, but the church is going to grow because of you not because of me so uh, let me give you some points in closing commit yourself to grow your ministry discover your call discover your call when you're young Find out what God wants to do within your life. And when you're old, never be satisfied in what you've done in the past. Discover your call. Your call. That is, what does God want me to do? One of the most important things that we can have in our lives, some of the greatest decisions that we make, when we understand that God wants to use me. Not God wants to use the church. God wants to use me to grow the church. When there's an empty seat beside you, do you know whose job it is to fill that seat? Any ideas? Bruce, you need to preach better sermons. Justin, you need to sing better songs. Josh, you need to have a better youth department. You know if the seat is beside you is empty, I'm going to be honest with you, I cannot take authority for empty seats or full seats. My job is to communicate the word. Our job is to fill the seats. Understand your call. When you understand your call, your call is not to be liked. Your call is to talk about Jesus. It's to serve, 
Him. It's our ministry. Discover your call. And then develop your gifts. Sometimes we never develop our gifts. And we've all received a spiritual gift from God. And we need to develop those gifts. Not just go day by day hoping everything's going to work out. And how do we develop those gifts? By getting into God's word. Find out what God wants me to do. Learn from him. Understand what he wants. Not just live a life, mundane life, hoping everything's going to work out. It is on purpose that we have to live our spiritual life. If we are a catalyst for God's growth within our family, what we must do is we have to say, I got a purpose. I have some gifts, and I'm going to develop those gifts. And the third one is engage your ministry. Engage it. 100%. I, I, on TV, on Fox News, it says, the greatest weekend of sports is this weekend. They had, they had the World Series on Friday. They had college football that K-State beat KU this week. And then tonight is the World Series and the Cowboys playing the Redskins and the Chiefs tomorrow night playing the Broncos and the World Series. It's the greatest weekend of sports is this week. And all that is fun to watch. But how much is that going to impact your life? Unless you're in Vegas, probably not a lot. But engaging in ministry changes your life and everybody else's life around you. You have to engage it. The greatest opportunity that you have to change somebody's life is not watching TV. It's not going to a game. Which you're, there's nothing wrong with it. But engage your ministry. And your ministry is, I am an ambassador of Jesus Christ. My job is not to be happy. My job as a minister of Jesus Christ is to communicate God's will for my life into somebody else's life. Not be ashamed. Not be afraid. Not say, I hope it works. It says this, I want to pray for you. And once I pray for you, and here's where sometimes Christians fail. Sometimes they get so arrogant because they've come to church and we know something about God. But here's what God wants you to do. Humbly, humbly bow your knee before God and say, Lord, use me. And when you get up from your knees and after you've asked God to use you, allow the grace, the love, and the forgiveness of God to be the ointment that you use when you talk to somebody else about God. Sometimes we tell them the sinner that they are, but we don't use the grace and the forgiveness of God to communicate to them the love of God. And sometimes they love God, they just don't like the church. Because the church becomes full of arrogant people, hypocritical people, because they think they are better than others. And what we have to do is we have to understand, I am a sinner that Jesus loves. I have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, and if it wasn't for God's forgiveness, I would be no one. I would have nothing. I would have no ministry. I would not be forgiven. My destiny would, would be hell. But because of what he's done for me, I have been forgiven and I have to engage ministry from the perspective that God loves me and he's called me to do something bigger than go to church. He's called me to be a minister in the church. And this is not Glenville Baptist Church. This is your church. This is what Jesus wants to do for you. This is God's church. And when God is the leader of the church, and we are following God's leadership. Leadership is this. I am moving forward. I am going to do a new thing within your life. You don't have to follow me. You can stay where you are. You can stay in your past. You can live in where you have been. But if you want a vitality, if you want a freshness, if you want an eagerness into the future... He says, I want to do a new thing within your life. Let's not get stuck in the past. Let's not get stuck in our sin. Let's do something greater than what we could ever think about doing. And the last is the most important. Fulfill your purpose. 
Fulfill your purpose. Once you understand that God has a calling within your life, you have a purpose within your life. A commitment is doing something as an action. You can't say I'm committed to you. I'm committed to this. Commitment is a word that we say. But true commitment is an action that we perform. Commitment is I am committed to Christ. Period. And when we are committed to Christ, things happen within our life. Commitment. It's a tough word. It's a tough sale. Because to be committed, everything changes. Jesus, when he called his disciples, he said, I want you to forsake everything and follow me. In our culture today, Christianity is, I want you to go to church. It doesn't say, I need you to read the Bible, I need to pray, I need to serve God. Commitment to Jesus is this, forsake everything. Easy believism, easy Christianity has people falling out of the church day by day, hour by hour, sermon by sermon. They don't like this about the sermon. They don't like this about God. They don't like this about the song. So they say, you know what? I don't like that church or I don't like that preacher. Or I don't like what they do. So I'm going to walk out the door. True Christianity is I am committed to do what God has called me to do. Commitment is an action. When we do that, when we're committed to what Christ wants to do, Everything changes. Are you tired of living in the past? Or I could ask, are you so happy of your past that you don't want to live into the future? If you're thinking the best days that you've had spiritually are behind you, then you're not living in the present and God can't give you a future. But the majority of us, if I could be so bold, that we are so fearful of what we've done in the past that we do not have a proper perspective of what Christ has already done for us. And what Christ has done for us is forgave us. What, what does that mean? Forgave. That means the sins that you were in, although they were red as scarlet, Christ has washed them white as snow. How can that be? See, we have the mindset and the mind capacity of a human. But God says, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. My actions are not your actions. So what that means is we cannot comprehend what God's ability is to do this and that's to forgive you. And until we understand I can stand vulnerable before God even in my past if I say Lord forgive me and the Lord says okay confess and repent and I will forgive. See, sometimes we say, Lord, forgive me, but we still do <laughs> what we've always done. And that means you'd have to ask God to forgive you 30,000 times a day. But when the Bible says, confess, repent, means turn around and go towards me, I will forgive you. And if we confess and we repent, God can give us a new life. And those five commitments that I believe we as Christians get stuck on, we cannot forgive. And we hold those grudges. And we have broken relationships. And we don't worship. And sometimes we're not engaged in ministry. But yet God, give me a new life. And he said this, I want to give it to you. I want 
I want your life to be restored. I want your kids to be healthy. I want your job to go great. I want your relationships to be restored. We know it up here. And we want it so bad. But we don't do anything about it. And sometimes it goes not only a year, two years, three years, five years, a lifetime. And we look back. That's my life. My life has been a mess. And God is saying today. Today in this church. I want to give to you something new. Something fresh. Something that you've never had. Oh. The Israelites were saved out of captivity. They crossed the Red Sea. And they wandered in the wilderness. And it was great. But then they started to murmur. They started to get mad at God because they didn't like the manna. And he said, guys, time out. Time out. There's a point in your life where you say, I want a freshness. I want something new. And that newness can happen in a church service or it can happen in your home. But it takes a commitment to your heart to say, I want this. Um, another analogy that, that I use um, and sometimes in our health we have to say have a commitment I want to lose weight but we don't go to the gym I want to do this but we continue to drink Dr. Peppers sometimes we have to make a commitment and you know what it's easy to make a commitment I can make a commitment every morning. I'm, I'm not going to drink a Dr. Pepper and then by 10 o'clock in the morning, well, that commitment's over with. And, you know, it's, our, it's already done. I can make another commitment tomorrow. But in our spiritual life, we're not playing with a Dr. Pepper. We're playing with other people's lives. And we're playing with an eternal destiny. Because there's a real hell. And there's a real heaven. And the people that we have influence with Wants to see you be real. One of our chaplains at the raceway, it's uh, Johnny Whitmore, came in and he said, Bruce, he said, uh, he said, I may need some of your marriage counseling material. I said, why is that? He goes, I'm having people talk to me about marriage all the time. And I said this, and I want you to grab this. If people are talking to you about their problems, do you know what that is? That's respect because they see something different in you. Than they do in their own life. So when somebody's asking you questions. If somebody's saying hey I need some help. That's a call. That's your ministry. That's an opportunity for you. To say you know what I don't know everything about marriage. But this is what I know. This is what God has taught me. And when somebody is asking. Any question. Don't try to appease them. Don't try to tickle their ears. Tell them, this is what Jesus has taught me. Put Christ in the center of everything that you do. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to, I told you to shut the doors earlier about your past. But here's what he does for you into the future. He opens those doors wide. He opens those doors to a point and he says this. Trust me. I may not know what tomorrow has in store. But I know that I'm in God's hands in tomorrow. And I know that he's never going to put me where I cannot handle. But I cannot stay where I am. Because where I am is not where God wants me to stay. He wants to do something new. Something fresh. If you're struggling in life. If you're hurting. Believe me, I know you're hurting. If you're not happy where you are spiritually, there's one thing that you can do. Lord, I want to make a commitment to you. I want the doors to my future to be wide open. And watch him open doors that you could never open. Watch him do things in your life that you couldn't even comprehend. But he told them, and as he's telling us, 
I want to do something new. Get rid of the junk. Get rid of your past. And have a future. Let me open the doors that you shut. And I guarantee you what I have in store for you tomorrow is a whole lot better than what you had yesterday. Because yesterday is full of regrets. Tomorrow is full of grace. Jesus loves us unconditionally. And he's our father. And he wants to do great things with us and through us.